with your permission, may I talk in time? Because we are the authority. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ria, I think I'm doing that now. Okay. 
างนั้นไม่ได้เร็วนี้เนี่ยเราก็ยังสามารถที่จะพัฒนาพันธุ์นำมาพันธุ์ใหม่ที่ในโลกไม่เกิดขึ้นนะครับนั่นก็คือการมันสมาธิซึ่งผู้ที่ให้กําเนิดอันนี้นั่นคือที่หลวงพ่อให้คนนั้นนะครับเติมเป็นคนพัฒนาและก็ผู้ผู้มันเป็นไทยเนี่ยรับลูกต่อเลยเอามาพัฒนาอยู่เป็นสินค้าส่งออกเวลานี้เราสามารถส่งออกแป้งแม็กซี่ไปขายได้ในหลายประเทศและเป็นที่มาครับที่ผมเรียนมานานแล้วเราเคยเห็นเห็นว่าของที่มาจากถิ่นเนี่ยเราสามารถจะมาพัฒนาได้แล้ววันนี้อันสำคัญก็เป็นพื้นที่สําคัญอันดับสามในการตรวจสอบที่อะไรได้แต่ว่าพื้นนี้ยุ่งเหมือนกำลังประสบกับความอย่างนี้ประสบกับความท้าทายหรือประสบกับอันตรายสามอย่างอย่างที่หนึ่งเราต้องแข่งขันกับพื้นเมืองที่ทุกแทนนั่นคือทุกคนนะครับซึ่งทุกคนต้องทราบว่ามันเป็นพื้นที่ซึ่งต้องตุนตุนเรื่อยนะครับแต่มันสำคัญนี่ที่ดีก็แพงขึ้นค่าแรงก็แพงขึ้นนะครับปุ๋ยก็แพงขึ้นเพราะฉะนั้นต้นทุนเรามีแต่เพิ่มขึ้นนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นอำนาจการแข่งขันเนี่ยเราบริวารอีโรนี่นะครับประการที่สองครับอันนี้ก็คือเป็นคนที่เขาที่บางท่านนั่งตาละห้อยคนนี้นะครับโดยเฉพาะอย่างที่รู้ประกอบการคือในช่วงสิปีสองปีมันเนี้ยเราเกิดทางอันหวนทางการเงินดอลลาร์เนี่ยเงินเงินบาทแข็งค่าขึ้นประมาณสิบห้าแต่ไม่รู้ประมาณสิบห้าเท่ากับว่าทุกบาททุกดอลลาร์ที่เราขายไปเนี่ยหายไปสามบาทเดือนนี้เดือนสามสิบทีนี้เมื่อเมื่อผู้ประกอบการที่ขายได้ทุกอย่างปรับไปสูงเดือนก่อนนักวันนี้เกษตรกรไทยได้รับค่าที่เขาเอามันไปขายเนี่ยปรับมาปีก่อนสามสิบสามสิบเปอร์เซ็นพอใจไหมครับพอใจนะทีนี้มันก็มาถึงมาเช่นที่สามก็คือสิ่งที่มาจากต่างประเทศเราไม่เคยมีก็คือซีเอดีซีเอดีมีตัวเลือกในแบบที่มันเข้ามาสู่ประเทศไทยเมื่อคนนี้อะไรมาจากลาวมาจากเทมินนะอะไรก็ไอันนี้เป็นเช่นที่เช่นยังไงหากว่าเกษตรกรผู้ปลูกเนี่ยก็คิดว่าเขาเสี่ยงในการปลูกคือเดี๋ยวนี้ปลูกกับแผนเสี่ยงต่อการสูญเสียอะไรอย่างเงี้ยก็จะเลิกปลูกเขาเลิกปลูกเมื่อไหร่เนี่ยคนมันมีงานนะโรงงานก็ต้องปิดเพราะสุขภัยเชนทุกอย่างสิ่งเหล่านี้มันเคยเกิดขึ้นแล้วนะครับในเรื่องพอหลายๆท่านที่นี่อาจจะยังอาจจะมีเรื่องนี้อยู่นะแต่ว่าเราไม่ยังเห็นว่าไอ้สิ่งนี้เกิดขึ้นนี้นะครับก็พยายามจะช่วยในเรื่องของสิ่งดีที่จะต้องการแก้ไข
จะคิดว่าเรื่องนี้มันสามารถเราเราก็ร่วมมือกันที่นั่นส่วนหนึ่งที่ผมได้กล่าวแล้วว่าข้าราชการว่าไอ้ผู้ที่จะจัดการก็เดินช่วยเราไปเรื่องกันตลอดทางนะครับแต่ทั้งหมายไม่ใช่ไรอย่างน้อยเจ็ปีเจ็ปีนะฮะที่เราทำแต่ว่าในระหว่างนี้ไอ้โลกทุกอย่างเวลานี้ผมเรียกว่าง่ายๆนะมันเข้าถึงครึ่งหนึ่งของประเทศมันไปถึงแก่นะฮะแต่ว่ามันอาจจะยังไม่ค่อยอินเทนซีคือคือมันอาจจะมีเจ็ดนะแต่ว่าไปนะฮะแต่ที่น่ากลัวที่สุดหลังจากการเปลี่ยนเกี่ยวปีนี้เมื่อมีการหาต้นเอาไปปลูกแพร่ขยายซึ่งผมหวังว่ามันจะแพร่ขยายอย่างรวดเร็วและมันจะอินเทนซีฟเพราะว่าการขยายตัวของซีเอ็นดีของในประเทศไทยมันเร็วมากเมื่อต้นปีเราพูดกันถึงว่ามันเข้ามาตามชายแดนตอนนั้นเราพบมาทันไรเมื่อสองเมื่อเดือนกว่ามันเข้าไปสี่ห้าหมื่นครั้งวันนี้ผมว่าเป็นแสนแล้วนะฮะผู้จัดเจมส์อาจจะไม่คงนะครับมันมันมันมันเรียกว่าอะไรสเปรย์ไปอย่างรวดเร็วเท่ากันนะครับแต่ว่าก็ไม่เหลือบาปอะไรที่มาเราช่วยนะครับที่จะแก้นะครับการสัมมนาในวันนี้ก็ต้องของความพยายามที่จะหาหนทางในการแก้ไขนี้นะครับโดยเราอาจจะที่ผมเรียนว่ามันเป็นพื้นใหม่ไม่ใช่เป็นไม่ไม่เป็นโรคไหนไม่ใช่โรคประจำถึงของเราเราก็ไม่มีความรู้นะฮะแต่ว่าเราก็จะเป็นผู้เรียนรู้จากผู้ที่มีประสบการณ์ประสบการณ์ในเรื่องเกี่ยวกับเรื่องโรคนี้เกี่ยวกับเรื่องทางวิทยาเราใช้ทางทางเกี่ยวกับเรื่องประสบการณ์ในการตามแก้ไขประสบการณ์ในการแมจไอไอที่เจอชั้นต่างๆนะครับซึ่งผมคิดว่าท่านผู้บรรยายทั้งสองเนี่ยจะได้มีความรู้ของพวกเราแล้วก็ท่านที่มาชูมันนี้ล้วนจะอยู่ในสถานะที่เป็นนักวิจัยนักพัฒนาพืชอะไรต่างๆที่จะได้มีส่วนในการช่วยความโรคเสี่ยงดีและแก้ไขนะครับผมก็ขอขอบคุณท่านผู้บรรยายทั้งสองนะครับที่ได้คุณให้ความรู้ของพวกเราและเชื่อว่าการทำงานวันนี้เนี่ยก็คงจะมาเกิดผลให้เราสามารถจะมีกำลังแข็งกล้าแข็งที่จะต่อสู้กับโรคนี้ต่อไปขอบคุณมThe next is the talk on managing the Salmon disease, pandemic sharing experience between Africa and Southeast Asia by Dr. James Lake. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I wish I could present in Thai, but after two short visits and one holiday, which was wonderful and intense. About 10 years ago, I'm definitely not qualified. I can do it Swahili if you like that. Um, so I'm going to talk about, give some background on the virus problem um, that we you know as the Southern Missouri disease. And uh, talk about experiences that I've had from Africa. Um, I'm not African, my skin is obviously white, um, but I've lived in Africa for more than 30 years, so most of my life has actually been up there. And I'm sad to say that most of it has been on Kisaka, 
and it's been on viruses affecting this hour. Sad or happy? I mean, obviously, it's, it's, it's nice to do good research work, but it's sad that we're working on problems that are devastating for farmers. I would like also to say before starting, it's a huge honor um, to be invited to make this talk by TTBI and Hassett University. It's fantastic. It's my second time here. It's also tremendous for me as a member of the CGIAR to be on the same stage as, as Hernan Ceballos. As we've heard, Hernan is a legend of the song in the CGIAR system. So for me to be with him, you know, that's, that's fantastic. So, um, very privileged. Okay, so I'm going to give a little bit of a background on the disease, how it is in Africa, how we're managing it there, and how some of that um, knowledge and experience can be used here in South America. Um, we thought this would be, be better for me to pre present some of the problems, and then Helen will talk about um, a little bit more about the solutions and how varieties are going to be the key to solving this problem in Thailand. When I came in June last year to Thailand, um, I saw a lot of healthy cassava plants. <laughs> this is how cassava should look. Um, actually, this is from Africa, so this is not from Thailand. This is, I think this is a picture taken from Burundi in um, East Central Africa. But <clears throat> for most of the time that cassava has been um, talked about, written about in Africa, um, it's, it, it looks like this. So, it's got the, the telltale symptoms, the typical symptoms of mosaic disease, the yellow, the slightly distorted leaves. Mosaic disease was first reported in the world, in Tanzania, where I'm, I come from, um, in the northeastern part of Tanzania, in a region called Tanga, um, and this was in 1894. But the first epidemic of, this is the microphone case, the first epidemic was in the 1920s, but then things changed in about the 1990s, and we have had a much, much more severe disease. More severe, I think, for those of you who've seen CMD in, in Thailand, you know, it's not at this stage. This is score five, and we yesterday we were talking about what is score four, what is score three, this is score five. And when you get this kind of severity, then you get no relief at all. Um, and so we were faced with a problem where we had more than one virus. Here we have one species. <coughs> For us, um, we used to have a virus called African Cassava mosaic virus, ACMP. But then we got spread of another one, which is quite different, called EACMB. UG2, that stands for Uganda, that was the first place where it was recognized. And we yield healthy plant. Four kilos, that's equivalent to 40 tons per hectare. Um, one virus, roughly half of the lead is lost, and with two, you can see that 90% is lost. So you know, we have a very, very severe problem. Now, as I mentioned, the first wave epidemic of cell mosaic disease in Africa was in the 1920s. So if you look at the literature for CMD, you see many reports from Africa, from old, the, kind of the colonial reports from Congo, from Nigeria, from Sierra Leone, from Madagascar, um, 1920s, 1930s, that's when CMD swept across Africa, probably similar to what's happening now in Southeast Asia, just probably one virus then, ACMD. Um, however, in the 1980s, we had this severe disease outbreak where the two viruses now came together. And, and I happen to be living in 1990, I was, I was there in Uganda. Now I'm here in Tanzania, down here. And it spread <coughs> covering um, four million square kilometers, huge area of East and Central Africa. And it seemed to be caused by big increases in the white fly populations. This white fly vector, as we sure we know, is the Mizzetabasi, and the numbers increased greatly, and this facilitated the spread of <coughs> viruses causing disease. When you have white fly 
nymphs like this, you know you have a big problem. Um, I'm sure you haven't seen this in Thailand yet. I hope you will not. But this is what we had in East Africa. When there's so many, they excrete, they, they feed on the, the flow of tissue of the plant under the leaves. And when they excrete, they excrete um, sugars which drop down onto the leaves and then you get fungus growing. And we call it sutimod. Um, and so you'll see that the leaves become black. So this plant has mosaic disease and also so many white flies that it's causing, they're causing physical damage. Now, if we look at the production of cassava in the world and its yields, as most of you I'm sure know, Asia is ahead, which is fantastic. It's because it's a commercial crop. Africa, we have more production of cassava in Africa than Asia, but the yields are less. It's a subsistence crop. The incentives are not so strong for farms to get high yields. Uh, in the Americas, it's in between. And another problem for Africa is we have many big Western disease problems. We got hit, affected by bee mite, um, the Maricellus tanaboa, which was brought in from Latin America, the mealy bug, also from Latin America. And these two now are controlled with biological control, as here in uh, Asia. Cassava mosaic disease and another virus disease called cassava brown street disease. Now, this problem in Africa now is somewhat solved because we have very good varieties which are hard to infect, almost immune. And this is how this problem was solved in Africa. And this will be the solution here in Southeast Asia too. It's going to be resistant varieties. So we better get them fast. Um, and then we'll tell you more. But we solved the problem with mosaic disease, and I'll explain how. But now we've been affected by another virus disease. And the resistant, mosaic resistant varieties are susceptible to ground street virus. So we solve one problem and another comes. Something to think about is there is an opportunity here to prepare or resistant to both. Maybe that's not an immediate priority, but it needs to be borne in mind because these viruses can be moved easily in cuttings, as has happened here. The viruses of cassava in Africa are many, not as many as South America, where cassava comes from. But we have very many Bogoma viruses. These are the ones that cause mosaic disease. We have nine species. Um, the most frequent are African cassava mosaic virus and East African cassava mosaic virus. And the one I mentioned before, East African cassava mosaic virus Uganda, is a strain. It's not a whole species. It's a recombinant between African and East African. We have two species of brown street virus. These are in a different family. These are Potiviridae RNA viruses in the genus Hypovirus. As we know, the, uh, the mosaic viruses are Germany Verde in the genus Begonia virus. There are some other minor viruses which are not important. In Asia, you have the two Begonia viruses. Um, but here in, in Southeast Asia, so far, I think it's only Sri Lankan for South mosaic virus that has been reported. This, if you had an electron microscope, this is how these viruses, the gamma viruses, this is how they look. Um, they have these geminate particles, and they're um, single-stranded um, DNA viruses with two components to the genome, DNA A and DNA B, each about 3,000 base pairs long. And the sizes, they're, they're pretty tiny for viruses, they're very small viruses, 30 by 20 magnitude. Transmission is not through seed, is not through roots. Very important. So you don't need to worry about seed, you don't need to worry about roots, but it is through 
white flies, and specifically through Vermisia tapasi, and it is through planting infected cuttings. Okay, I, I won't go through the details of the transmission. When we monitor mosaic viruses, one nice thing compared to brown streak viruses is we can tell where the plant has been infected by a, a white fly vector. And this is very important in monitoring programs. Um, and already this is being done in Thailand by the, the experts, the virologists and the entomologists that so are monitoring uh, mosaic disease. Healthy plant becomes infected by a vector, symptoms. Symptoms here, no symptoms here. This is white fly infection. Where this is common, that means you have a spreading epidemic. Where you don't have epidemic conditions, you will find most infection is cutting infection. Even the bottom leaves show symptoms. That's because the, when the cutting was planted, it had the virus inside it. So how did, how did we manage the problem in Africa? First of all, there was a lot of basic research. When we had a severe disease, people were scratching their heads and saying, you know, what's going on? You know, is it a different virus? Is it, is it the varieties? Is it the climate change? So a lot of research on improving our understanding, developing diagnostic methods. We need to be able to detect viruses. Sometimes we cannot see them in plants. We don't see symptoms. A new infection, when the white fly has infected, symptoms will not appear until three to five weeks after inoculation. So during that period of one month, you cannot see symptoms. But with your PCR tests, you can detect. So very important to develop um, accurate, sensitive, and reasonably priced diagnostics. Uh, surveillance to track the disease. So with this, we did lots and lots and lots of surveys um, all over Africa, particularly Eastern and Central Africa, to find out where um, the spirit of the disease is, um, which are the threatened areas, so where we should focus our control efforts. Identification of new resistant varieties, exchange of germ plasm. Always you'll develop varieties in one place and you will want to move them to another. Okay, but you have to do, them, do it in a very safe way and make sure you do not move virus from place to place. When you have improved varieties, you need to multiply them and share them with farmers as fast as you can, so rapid multiplication and dissemination. And as you disseminate planting material of resistant varieties, it's, it's very important that quality is sure. Okay. People need to be made aware now this is very important. Um, knowledge should be shared. People need to know. Farmers need to be aware. Policy makers need to be aware. Extension staff need to be aware. Um, all Kassan stakeholders in countries that are not yet affected need to be made aware. And white flight control for us, Kassan, is primarily subsistence. So people grow it and they eat it. Right? So they're not investing much money. So it's not easy for a farmer to spend money on pesticides. So normally our white fly control has only been in high value sites. This is industrial production sites or clean seed multiplication sites. Finally, strengthening capacity is super important that people improve their knowledge, improve their skills, and share from country to country, from region to region. Number one priority, resistance. This will be the solution here as it was in Africa. This has been the solution to the CMD problem so that now we don't worry about CMD. If we have a problem somewhere, we know we can get resistant varieties from some other place. Okay. These are, this is an example. This is it's one field, but I didn't take the plants next to each other because I wanted to show all the varieties next to the local susceptible variety, but you can see the kind of symptoms we have. 
It looks a little bit like green light, but there was no green light there. But these are very small um, plants are stunted, but these resistant varieties, you, know, you can see the behavior is totally different. Totally different. So surveillance and monitoring, um, resistant variety introduction, you have to evaluate, you have to go through the release process, hopefully in a mass track weight as quick as possible. And then we'll, I'm sure, talk more about this. Training, diagnostics, multiplication, dissemination. So you need a, an integrated strategy combining various components. And when you exchange, you need to be doing virus testing, virus indexing. Um, you need to be able to harden tissue culture material when you move from one country to another. Um, we use an approach called open quarantine, which I think was the first time this has been used in Africa, certainly for cassava. When we knew that, we took material from Uganda where we had resistant varieties, to Tanzania where we did not. But we knew that the virus had already spread there, so we took cuttings across the border, and we, we monitored them. The Tanzanian authorities had quarantine stuff. They monitored the field for a year, but we were multiplying in the process. So we built up the amount of resistant material inside the new country, and then that new material could be disseminated um, with farms. So there's more than 100 million uh, cassava growers in, in Africa now growing virus resistant cassava. Um, and because of all the monitoring and surveillance, we can um, measure changes in, in regions and provinces. In, in the case, Tanzania, we, we have uh, these are our districts. Um, this is changing the disease from 2006 to 2009. Now, the blue colors. That's negative, so the disease went down. Right? The red color, the disease went up, or red or yellow. Now, you can see most of the area, the disease has gone down. So this is the resistant varieties were spreading. Farmers were growing resistant varieties. The level of disease went down. Seed quality is very critical, and even more so now in the um, eastern central Africa have another virus problem. So, and this one is not so easy to see. Brown street disease, the symptoms are not so clear as the mosaic disease. The mosaic disease, you can see the yellow, you can see the leaves are you know, distorted. Brown street, the, the leaves, the symptoms are on the lower leaves. Sometimes they're not present. So you have to be sure that you have virus tested material and that you not by that under control conditions and then disseminate the farmers. Where is in Thailand? CMD will be everywhere. That will mean that clean seed will be precious, very, very precious. And so you need to have a system for producing clean seed. So what we did in, in Tanzania is we had no clean seed. Even the researchers, we went to the research fields and we said, where's your best variety? They said, oh, it's, there's a field there, from five hectares. We went there. Disease, 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 disease. 50% disease. But they do experiments there on, on the virus spread, so it's not surprising, right? You know, if, you, if you want a healthy field, you have to plant it far from the source of the virus. So we had to start a new system, and we identified isolated sites. And we planted, we selected healthy material, and we planted them in isolated sites. And we were able to establish almost virus-free material, and we called this free basic um, material, planting material. We started with a small number of varieties. We started with what we had. And this is another important lesson, I think, for Thailand. You begin with what you have, and then you become stronger. And you make your plant bigger and bolder and more, with more elements and more varieties. And, but you start with what you have. We had two varieties. Now we're adding many more. Now we have probably 12 in Tanzania, which we're promoting through the clean seed system. So we set up a system like this. Um, these are the stages. So we have the breeders. The breeders make new varieties. Then it goes to breeder seed core, pretty basic. I don't know what, what system do they use in Thailand. Is 
but it still somehow works. Um, we're using it and we're extending it um, as a simple way that extension officers can use to identify the presence of the main virus diseases. So it, it will recognize in Africa, CMD, brown sweet disease, mite damage, and health plant. And as well as giving you an identification, it will give you advice about how you can control the problem. And what we wanted also to do is to link with another ICT system. So it's, it's using artificial intelligence, um, and machine learning, developer machine learning to recognize symptoms. And there's a, a back end where you can generate reports and you can generate maps. And so this illustrates where some of the reports have been made. Um, this is Western Kenya. Western Kenya, there's a lot of work that's been done, so you can see there's quite detailed information. Many reports from farmers on the presence of virus diseases in Western Kenya. But we're trying to link the that's what we have with with seed tracker. And seed tracker is a, another IC, ICT tool developed um, by our IIT virologist, Ralph um, Kumar in Nigeria. Um, and it is a system for registering seed producers of cassava and then organizing the certification. And so everything is online. Although when you register, when you do a certification, you do not have to be online when you fill in the form. But at the moment, um, people do um, inspectors for the seed inspection service doing an inspection of a seed crop. They've been going in forms. They fill in a form, they travel a long way, one week, they come back after two, two weeks, the form goes somewhere, someone has to enter it, the mistakes. Now everything is finished in the field. The certificate, the inspection is done in the field, immediately in the headquarters the result is there. And even I, I can see the result because IT has assisted. After some time, the link with IT will be cut, so IT will not see anymore but it will still be used by the seed certification agency. So this is being, it's, it's been rolled out in Nigeria, and it's now being used in Tanzania, and um, it's, it's gonna be shared with several other countries too. <clears throat> this is an example of a farmer called Antonia, who's in northwestern Tanzania, got some help from her son to enter information on her seed crop. She's producing uh, virus-free cell plant material, um, the system will enter data for, for her, and so this is the, the data that's accessible through the seed certification agency. So she is on the map, um, her contact information is there, um, the variety she's growing, the area, the date of planting. Now this is the, the map and the data that is available inside the system for people who have access to Username and password. So this is the officials of the certification agency. But anyone, even you here now, could go to seedtracker.org and you can see all the seed production in Tanzania is open. And you can get the contact numbers. You can phone up a farmer in Tanzania and say, aha, I see you on the field of you know variety TMS 0572. Um, how much do you have? When will it be ready? What's the price? From here, you could do that actually now. They, they probably speak Swahili, so you might have a communication challenge. But, but the point is that anyone in Tanzania can see where the seed is. And they have the contact numbers of the seed producers. And so we think it's going to drive the seed business. And it's important because these seed producers are respected and they have high quality content of the best varieties, resistant varieties. So it's going to drive new varieties and raise the quality standards. <clears throat> We've also been doing a lot of work to promote the business of seed producers because these are the people who are delivering the improved varieties to farmers. And we need to assist them and make, help them to make money from it. Um, so most of them are quite small scale, but they can make profits and they're doing it and they're continuing to do it for several years. So it's working for us. And so from Tanzania, we're now using 
similar approach in other countries like Rwanda, Burundi, Congo. And so we've had some you know, economists who've worked with farmers to build up good um, business models so they can make their profitable business. So we're trying to link the, the diagnostic, uh, the phone diagnostic with seed trackers. So the diagnostic field of farmer can look at their field and see, aha, I have a CMD. And then it'll say the seed tracker, click to find your nearest seed source. Aha, oh, the nearest seed source is, uh, is Hernan. Ah, Hernan has got a variety of trees here, but too bad. And he's only five kilometers away. Okay, so let me call Hernan. So by linking these apps, we think it's going gonna, it's gonna to drive them. Again, it's going to drive the input in the Kasawa um, production system. Okay, so strategy for Southeast Asia now. This was the status last time I came here in June 2018. At that time, there were seats in the two provinces in Vietnam, six provinces in Cambodia, where the first report was made, not present in either Lao Republic or Thailand. The situation in Thailand in Vietnam was very, very bad. Everything was infected, so we were a bit shocked. But um, we also were aware that there were big movements of sea from Thailand into Cambodia. But there were not such there was not a movement of sea from between Thailand and Cambodia. Certainly from Cambodia to Thailand. I think originally people were thinking the epidemic is just coming from, from cuttings, infected cuttings, but we saw lots of white fly infection in Tini. Although at the time there were not very many, but we saw lots of white fly infected plants. When we came um, to Thailand with uh, Dr. Silva Mandisa and her team, we saw very few white plants, very few. Um, however, we know that they can spread in a year from experience in Africa up to 100 kilometers in one year. So we knew that the, the potential for spread from Cambodia to Thailand is very significant. So the first report was in um, northeastern Cambodia, and then you know, there's been spread through the region, and then several months ago, I think this was in May, I knew when I made this slide. There were reports from Thailand also, and also some reports from northern Vietnam and also from China. But going back to last, last year, this, this is how it looked in Tehid. And this is a thing with a infect, healthy versus infected plant. This was, I think, the only healthy plant that we could find in the whole field. There was almost no healthy plants there. But in in Thailand, it was like this. So we went to Bumiram, Surin, Sakyao. We didn't find a single weed. With Vernon and uh, um, Kim, we walked long distances, many steps. <laughs> and we, we saw many plants, but we didn't see any single infected plant. Um, and so the last time then, we proposed uh, these elements in a, a control plan. And as you'll see, these have not really changed. So surveillance, um, geoplasm development and promotion, quarantine, seed mm -hmm. systems, and capacity building and awareness raising. Okay, so this is Thailand in June 2018, but this is a few days ago. This is the field here, um, heavenly disease. So we've, we've gone from, I can't remember the names, but we went towards the Cambodia border, came down, Takao, and then came back, we went to Bidira, and um, a lot of infected the you know. Um, these actually are not the best pictures. You know, we got pictures yesterday which were even more dramatic in the sense that the, 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 the disease was more severe. But you can see, you know, going from healthy to fields where everything is infected. And the shocking thing is most of it is infected by white. So some cutting in critical plants, but most as well. So this is the scale of the challenge, as I see it in Thailand. So 
there are 12 provinces affected. And it's more than 100,000 square kilometers, those provinces. Now, obviously, Kasapa is not in all of those provinces, but it's a big area. The area where uh, you know, others, some, some of the Thai uh, experts, have got detailed maps, which is great. Um, but there's a huge area affected there. What was shocking for me also is the, the width of the country has been affected. So from the far east to the west, you have infection which is somehow shocking for me, which is the reason why I, I think that you could say this is, this could be the fastest spreading virus epidemic in recorded history. But this is faster than anything I've seen in Africa, which to me is very shocking. I, mean, I didn't expect to see this. And last year, I, I didn't think this was, the situation was like this. This year, it's very alarming. And I think there's a very strong case. Um, it's kind of sad for Thailand and Southeast Asia, but it's, there's a strong case to say it could be the most important black disease epidemic anywhere in the world. I mean, there are other big ones, you know, so we can debate. You know, there's a sign leather, there's, um, there's tropical race for fusarium and bananas. Um, there are the virus, the, the stem rust, there's uh, Lucian 99, there's uh, there are the cassava epidemics in Africa, but this one could be the fastest spreading. Maybe not the economically the most big, but the fastest spreading of this. And of course, you have a huge billion dollar starch industry, which needs to be protected. So, having said all this, this is a, if you like, a quick five point plan, a revised plan based on the new, sort of new experiences. Um, so some of my thoughts about how this could be addressed here in Thailand, specifically for Thailand. So not so much for the region, but here for Thailand. Um, I think teamwork, this is something that we benefited from a lot in Africa. The countries were working together. We had multiple teams, multidisciplinary teams. Um, you know, we had people from research, universities, extension, farmers, and, and industry kind of coming together. Industry for us is small. But here to be, I think it's very important. You need to have some kind of very strong team. And I propose something like the National CMD Task Force. Now, maybe this already exists, but if it doesn't, I think it should exist. And communication. This is the time to talk. This is the time to write. This is the time to share information, share images to the max the maximum possible, because that's going to get you faster to where you need to be. You need to fix the problem, and the problem will be fixed with this practice, but to do it as fast as possible, you need to be sharing information, and that's going to push you to your goal faster than if you're not sharing information. So the more information you're sharing, the better. Open sharing, um, raising awareness, you know, policy makers, uh, Ministry people, extension, farmers, internally, externally. Because you know, definitely there's this kind of assistance that can be, can be got from outside as well. Um, regular media, you know, newspapers, TV, radio, brochures. I'm sure you're doing any of this already, social media. Very, very important. Surveillance. Surveillance. Certainly is here. And they will always be here. It's not going to go away ever. Um, and in some ways, you, you, you kind of know the country will be covered very fast. I think based on the experience that we've seen from last year to this year, it will go very fast. However, you still need to monitor progress. And one of the important things about surveillance now will be monitoring your progress in solutions. Okay, so this is how it was. This is how it is now. You can monitor the success of your work. And this is one, I showed you a figure with, with lots of districts with improvements. This is very important, particularly if you're getting money from government or you're getting money from donors. You need to demonstrate the success of your work. And this is a very important way that you can do it. But if you can have a national team, if you, if you can have standard protocols, if you can have standard, maybe a time, we know already from the work of King and from the others in the Department of Agriculture, 
Now, there's some times when you have many white flies, you have lots of infections, so it's a good time for these surveillance to work. And key elements need to be the percentage of plants infected to skin the incidence, the severity of disease, because that tells us how the varieties are responding, white fly abundance, and virus presence. Sometimes there's more virus than the symptoms show because plants have just been infected. Or maybe, particularly with resistant varieties, it's not always obvious the symptoms. Phone-based methods can also be helpful. So you can have teams of researchers, of ministry teams, that go and do surveys with vehicles. But you can also have people on the ground recording their own information. And this is how we're using that. And we're using plant-based We have extensionists and farmers who are making their own reports. And that can help the system, the team that's trying to manage the problem, to get information faster. Because the farmers are always there. It also builds the knowledge of the farmers because they can learn stuff through using the phone app because there's lots of information. Um, it's going to be very important to establish a clean sun system. Now, the wonderful thing is this is already starting. And you know, we, we went to TV, TTVI and there's amazing progress there. You know, there's these fantastic new structures being built. There's tissue culture. There's um, something a bit like, like SNH. There's, there's the 20x, 80x multiplication system. And you can see the kind of you know, new structures that have been planned. And huge greenhouses, which are going to be hugely valuable, of course. But as mosaic spreads throughout, you will need a certification system. You need sources of quality planting material. Not just at the top, not just at TTDI, or rail, or you know, elsewhere, throughout the country. You will need a system for, for producing and delivering clean seed of the best varieties you have. So you need to establish this in the way that I've described pre-basic, basic, basic certified for greenness, foundation, commercial. The certified um, fields will need to be um, inspected by trained teams, you need guidelines, and you can make this simpler with ICT tools to register producers. And that can help them build their business as well in seed production. <clears throat> and you need strategic reserves of clean seed. Now, again, this is something where we've seen evidence that this is already happening. So you have TTBI where these, these kinds of screenhouses are already in place, and even bigger ones are coming. Um, you will need similar kinds of sites in you know, different parts of the country of the major cassava growing areas. So they need to be safe, distant from surrounding infected fields. And you'll need a national network of basic clean production sites. Once you've identified resistant varieties, you're going to need to rapidly multiply, multiply them as fast as you can. Okay, so we've already talked about some of the techniques, and again, this is already happening. So there's some kind of improvements that probably can be made, but it's wonderful to see that it's already happening. Apply the best technology, tissue culture, virus mixing, um, adapt SAH to time conditions. Um, this is, as I said, already been done, but it could be improved a little bit. Um, possibly farmers could get involved in some rapid modification themselves with some simple screenhouses. Again, this is already been initiated at uh, TTBI, where we've got some basic structures that would be um, put up by farmers and used for um, basic clean plant material multiplication. Varieties, I think I'm not going to talk about varieties because Bernard's going to provide a whole talk on that, but um, uh, I think you need to go with what you have now. You need to start, you cannot just wait until the perfect resistant variety comes. You need to go with what you have. So you should be multiplying other plant material of some varieties which need to be identified now. Um, and then as improved material, better resistant varieties come, then you'll get better in it. Um, and accelerate breeding efforts. Again, this is the, the um, stuff that's going to be talked about by Ben Am, um, led by CNET Arguinas, um, supported by SEAT, and yeah, seeking input from other you know, uh, agencies as well, so CT, 
CRI in India, and IT can also provide some assistance where we can. And uh, resist the sources. Provide prioritize what's available now, and then you'll introduce new, new sources. But again, Bernard's going to talk more about this. With that, I would like to say thank you very much. Just thanks particularly to King Siran Marusa who invited me here last time for the first time and has also helped um, with Ed in facilitating my time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. demonstrated is that the Wi-Fi populations change at different times of the year. 
So you can go now and think, well, there's very few white flags, but at another time of the year, they're very many. And so, you know, she's um, just, well, she's demonstrated experimentally that there are times of the year in, in May, June, uh, when the conditions are high. And this is when there's profits for um, So, yeah, compacted material has been moved, and then it's been spread by white flags. But most of the plants, are in big So you've got a small amount of long distance spread um, through cuttings, but once it gets there, it's being spread. Back. It can be spread over significant distances. Because the white flies, when they when they get the virus, it stays within their life. And they can, they can move quite significant distances from the wind. So um, one other thing on, on my question, well one thing that we do in Tanzania is that we only allow certified producers um, on the system. So if you fail your certification, you don't appear in seed tracker. You're not there. So anyone who goes there looking for healthy material will not see you because you will not be put on the map. So somehow it's, a, it's controlled. The system is a bit controlled. And that's helping us to ensure that anyone who buys online We'll get from a certified producer. And I think this is something probably you could do this, do this here in the as well. Um, then the issue of so what do farmers do with infected stems? And I, I think in, you know, there, there's been less of a um, institutional effort in Africa to control this. So farmers have typically, the, the worst material, like you saw some very badly infected plants. They typically abandon them. So they'll just leave them. Now, some of them will sprout, um, but many of them will die. Many of the stems will die. And uh, it's, it's also, we have, the weather generally is drier than it, than it is here. But here it's quite humid. Um, and so, I mean, you, you know, you can obviously you can burn stems, you can bury stems to destroy them. Um, three meters sounds very extreme to me. Um, I'm not sure why you would need three meters because, I mean, you just need to prevent the plant from sprouting, right? So, um, it's supposed to be very, very deep and there's no way it's going to sprout. But three meters sounds quite a bit excessive. Um, but, you know, if you have huge volumes, I mean, it's going to be a big challenge. Um, obviously, the simplest thing would be to burn it, I would say. But this, you know, thinking about the environmental aspects, this might also not be able. So, um, yeah, I think I don't have a good answer for that. What would they try to do? They try to chop it down to small pieces and then make kind of a uh, chip or something like that. But uh, I don't know how much it's going to work. I just don't want to know the extreme in Africa. In Africa, sometimes it's used, I mean, the sort of stems will be dried and used as, you know, material for fire, like, like effectively like a fire um, So that's probably what they need to do. Thank you, Dr. Zinn, for your presentation. And I have a question of the app because I never use the app on London. The ten circle or the sequester before. And when we use it to take a photo of the leaf that has symptoms of the CMD, this app can be differentiated between the symptom of the CMD or symptom of the nutrient deficiency or when the symptom of the disease. So yeah, one of the problems with using the app in Southeast Asia is that herbicide damage. Herbicides are not used in Africa, um, very rarely. And so we don't see herbicide damage. But here, the last time I came here, we saw a car. You know, we were looking for CMD. I said, oh, maybe that's CMD, but it's herbicide damage. Um, I think it's always clear or a trained person that this is herbicide damage. So, you know, you could, a researcher, trained researcher would not confuse them, but the app definitely could confuse them. 
that's why I think it would need some further work to make it better. Because I'm sure that there will be some confusion between herbicide damage and CND symptoms. Talking about the free trade, we try to do that in Thailand. We start doing it. Uh, it is initiated by a starch factory okay. because you know that that's probably one solution. Uh, the problem is um, at the moment uh, there seems to be sort of a notion uh, from, from the government body to really uh, help turning the wheel, you, you know that sometimes it's difficult to initiate something new. I don't know the experience in, in, in Tasmania. When they start doing it, uh, did the government get involved with the program or they did it by private uh, agency? In Tasmania. Yeah, so in, in, in Tasmania, um, the government is heavily involved. Um, so we work with the Tanzania Official Seed Certification Institute um, and we work with the Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute and these are the main people working on cassava um, and so through the work with these we've been able to set up a sort of free basic system because the breeders work for the government they're in Tari, Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute. So they are producing varieties and we have Tishikosha Labs or Virus Index here. And then it goes into screen houses, which are managed by the research institutes in the different regions of, of Tanzania. And from there it then goes to private producers. Uh, we call them basic seed producers, who are private people, small companies or big farmers. Uh, and they're, yeah, they're in different parts of the country and from there it goes to certified producers. So the whole system has been put together through a, a big project involving the government. So I would say there's been 100% you know, support from the government. The government recognizes that the virus disease problem is hugely important, which is great. You know, so there's, there's no problem there. Um, and they recognize that unless it's managed, then you know, they're not going to make progress with, with production. Right now, China has come to Tanzania with a huge demand. They're saying we need 2.5 million tons of cassava chips. <laughs> so this is another reason why the government is, is actually become very, very serious. You know, they say, well, you know, how do we do this? You know, we need to do this, this, and this. Um, so they're thinking very seriously about all that's required in order to boost their productivity. Because in the moment, the total production is 5 million tons of fresh. So it's probably like less than 2.5 million tons of chips. 
So they need to double their production just to meet that demand. So um, yeah, the government is very much supporting. excellent varieties, hard-working farmers. But somehow we have managed to destroy these paradigms. We have worked consistently to destroy these paradigms. Uh, I have to acknowledge that uh, in our case, we have been very slow addressing the issue of which has grown that has affected the region for many years, and we didn't pay proper attention to it. More importantly, about 10 years ago, there was the introduction of the millibag that created a big problem for Thailand. I remember how scared we were with the millibag. Uh, luckily, along with it, we quickly introduced uh, the biological control of the millibag again, once again, as a result of the collaboration with IAPA. And quickly, remarkably quickly, we solved the problem. 
you know, and, and we should be very proud of how quickly the problem was solved. But that also created some sort of confidence that we can defeat everything in front of us. Now we have CMD uh, introduced either to Vietnam or Cambodia. We will never know where it landed first. But the issue is that it's now a big, big problem. And let's face it, it's going to be much more difficult to solve than the military was. So, uh, and uh, I, I, I have to keep delivering bad news is that CMD is so bad that people will look for solution. And the solution available is from Africa. So many people might be tempted to bring in cuttings from the varieties that uh, James uh, has described that are very good to the disease. But they are not immune, and along with these resistant varieties, new strains of CMT virus can come into Southeast Asia, and more importantly, they might introduce cassava brown street disease, for which we don't have as good source of resistance as, as we have for CMD. So, we had also some hopes. We were just trying to avoid acknowledging the magnitude of the problem we had. And the, uh, James was, was showing some pictures uh, that we saw in cassava fields just a few months ago. And we were sort of dreaming or hoping that the spread of CMD will be slow. This is very recent way of thinking that we have. No, 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 CMD is, you know, Vietnam is far away. No, 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 no. it will not come to time. But it will, it will come when we have already resistance deployed in the field. Uh, we thought that the white flies in Southeast Asia are not as aggressive and efficient transmitting CMD as those in Africa. Says who? Uh, certainly, uh, one thing in favor for us, for the time being, is that we only have one strain of the virus, for the time being. We have managed to destroy paradise, and uh, you can bet that there will be people introducing new strains of CMD and cassava brown street disease in order to solve the problem that we have already created. And in doing so, we will make things much worse. Uh, we hope that uh, there will be some degree of resistance to CMD in native germplasm of cassava here in Thailand. Well, the reality is somber and much, much worse than we thought. CMD landed very quickly in Saudi in, in Thailand. Let me share you what uh, the answer I got from James. I said, what is the take-home message that you can get from this piece? What is surprising? You learn from things that you don't expect. You don't learn from things that you already know. And his response, and he was very emphatic during his, his presentation, is the spread, the, the speed, and the vastness of the spreads of CMD. So let's acknowledge that we have a huge problem here, and it is much worse than we had hoped for. It is really bad, and it's going to pay much worse in the years to come. This is the first step for solving the problem. Acknowledging that you have a problem and acknowledging how serious it is. That creates 
the sense of urgency that we must have at this point. As expected, and this is not surprising for James, we have a lot of uh, genetic variation in response to CMV. KU50 and Rayon72 are indeed materials that tend to get less infected as incidents than uh, other uh, clones. This is not surprising. This is, we expected this. And it is in a way a welcome news because KU50, Rayon72 will slow down the spread of the disease to a certain extent. But let's accept it. Eventually, they get infected, and it will not prevent, actually, the, the problem. It will not be the source of the solution to the problem. It will be an important component of the immediate steps that we can take to slow down the problem until we have the, the ultimate solution that will be when we can de deploy truly resistant varieties, as it has been the case in Africa. We have good news. Uh, for instance, uh, Rayom 11, which is very susceptible to CMD, as we just saw, has clearly levels of resistance to features room. Of course, that is typically the case. We have a fantastic trait in one variety, but uh, a very poor response in other trains. So it's resistance to uh, witch's broom, but susceptible to CMD. Whereas KU50 has uh, a much better reaction against CMD, but is susceptible to witch's broom. So this is life. Um, so we have. The important message is that we have germplasm available, which are the source of the solution to our problems. Uh, luckily, also, we had introduced sources of resistance to CMD several years ago in prevention to the eventual introduction of CMD. Cassese University had introduced some source of resistance that helped us speed up the process to uh, react to the problem we have. Unfortunately, these source of resistance are all varieties that see a tag from Africa, which are probably not the best materials that we can use to solve the problem. So once again, and I, you will hear this over and over and over again because it's essential the collaboration between different institutions. IITA generally, generously sent to Thailand a set of uh, new varieties, some of these type of germplasm that, uh, that we saw in James' presentation, with very good levels of resistance and also improved agronomic performance and slant types that might better feed the needs of cassava in Southeast Asia. And we also have financial support from the Australian government for an important project uh, to deal with CMD and witches group. This project was begun, was launched about a couple of months ago. So we have basically all the elements that we need to solve the problem. Key characteristics of CMD, how can I dream talking about this after the presentation we heard from James? So that, that is my take from what uh, we have learned from my IPA. It is induced by a Gemini virus. There are several strains of the virus, mixed infections, uh, which is when you have the, comp the, the simultaneous presence of more of one strain or the virus ca can have a much more severe 
effect on the plant. It is uh, transmitted uh, in a persistent way by white flies and also transmitted by stem cattle. Uh, there is a very important asset which is what we call CMT2, is a dominant source of resistance that uh, has been the basis of the success in Africa to control the problem. CMT2 is a single gene. We have not been able to uh, sequence the gene and uh, we have evidence that there is strong interaction with other modified genes in the genome. So CMD2 is helped with the synergy of other genes, which is not unusual uh, in the case of this reaction to diseases. And we have a good marker for the gene. In fact, out of the materials that uh, Casesa University developed crossing elite Thai germplasm with the sources of resistance that we introduced in 2011. We selected those genotypes that carry CMD2 using this technology that has been perfected by IIDA several years ago. Uh, we have only one strain of the virus for the time being. Uh, White fly pressure in Southeast Asia might be lower than, than in Africa, but uh, does it really matter? Uh, that might be the case, but remember what surprised uh, James, and he made the point several times during his presentation. What we see is white fly transmitted CMD. So this question is actually irrelevant. We have very effective way of transmitting white uh, CMD from disease to healthy plants through the white fly spectrum. And all germplasm so far evaluated is susceptible, although there are degrees of reaction to the disease. So what are, uh, what are our options? We can manage the disease and uh, we can ultimately deploy CMD resistance. And these are not mutually exclusive uh, alternatives. We have to do everything we can do now. Use every possible technology, integrate it so that we can do our best to minimize the problems that we have created. So what are the management options? Uh, this is a, a remarkable thing that I can take from, from James' presentation. He spent a lot of time talking about seed systems. And we have to hear what he had to say. To say. So uh, a key ingredient for the time being, because that is the only thing we can do right now, to deploy something in the field is a proper management of planting material. We have to uh, consider the fact that a lot of CMD can also be transmitted by stem cuttings. So if we produce clean planting material, we start to address the problem. Uh, we call it positive selection. Partners should not use planting material from plants that have symptoms of the disease. Uh, farmers should not purchase planting material from unknown sources. Uh, we should be constantly eliminating plants from the field that show the symptoms. These are measures that might be effective when you have low incidence, but in certain fields in Thailand, this is already out of control. Uh, in managing diseases in Latin America, like frog skin disease, we define the corner of, prosper corner of prosperity. This is the idea that farmers use part of the field as a source, pre-assigned source of planting material. And this is where special care will be taken, eliminating diseased plants, and fertilizing it, and 
necessary treating with insecticides. Is the corner of prosperity effective? Yes. You think not? Okay, uh, well, uh, this is uh, a picture, a composed picture I took uh, last year in Cambodia. Here you have planting material from several varieties that had been grown under the, pros uh, the, the corner of prosperity, as we call it, principle. So they were producing the, plant, the planting material and eliminating plants with, which had symptoms. And immediately in front of it is a farmer's field. So these varieties are susceptible. The difference is uh, the, how well the plastic material has been produced. So another example, these are photographs taken. These fields are in front of each other good management of planting material and bad management of planting material. Now, the corner of prosperity will work if the, the rate of infection from disease to healthy plants is slow, low or inefficient. Based on what we have seen in, in, in Thailand, the white flies are doing a very good job transmitting CMD from disease to healthy plants. So uh, it, it will help, but it is, again, not uh, a solution. Um, so these are questions that I had before coming to Thailand this week. So now we have evidence that the white flies are really very efficient. So, the corner of prosperity can work if things are done very efficiently and uh, you can avoid this kind of situation. This is a, a Leurotrachello socialis, a white fly, white fly present in South America. When you have this much white fly, I think that nothing can prevent the spread of CMT. However, here there is a possibility to control it. Is it useful to control the white flies? Uh, it might be useful to treat stem cutting so that the, 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 the plants that sprout from the stem cuttings are protected for two months. If you combine this with rogging the plants, and if you plant KU50 rather than Rayon 11, the combined effect of rotting, protected cutting, and a variety that is lower to pick up the disease, then you might have some measure to slow down the problem. It will not be the solution. But at least it is what we have at hand today. So the ultimate solution is the deployment of resistant varieties. And that is where we are going. Uh, CMD2, that is a source of resistance identified in Africa and deployed in Africa for several decades now, is effective, it has not broken down, and it is relatively easy to introduce because it's mostly a single dominant gene. I said that because there are these other modifying genes that might be good to have along with it. So, in relation to the sources of resistance, uh, these are ideas that, again, we discussed uh, a year ago uh, with Peter Kulako, my colleague from IATA, the cassava breeder from IATA. So the driving principle here is that a plant from an introduced clone that can survive CMT is better than a dead plant from a beautiful type variety that has succumbed to CMT. This introduced material might not be as good from the genetic point of view as type varieties, but surviving is more important. 
So we have, as I mentioned, several available sources of CMT. Uh, we introduced some of it in 2011. Uh, IATA sent to Thailand uh, five clones uh, that are much better than the original sources that we introduced, introduced in 2011. We are hoping to have Indian varieties that have been developed for the starch industry there carrying CMD2 actually introduced from the same germplasm that we introduced in Thailand a few years ago. So uh, this material is good enough because the Indians took advantage of it. And India has the same kind of strain that we have in Southeast Asia. We can uh, use, introduce segregating populations carrying CMD2. We can bring in thousands of botanical seeds. As uh, James mentioned, CMD does not transmit through botanical seed. Or we can use segregating populations that are produced locally, something that we are already doing. More importantly, we have the germplasm collection at Rayon Field Crops Research Institute, and it is possible that we have new sources or the same CMD2 source of resistance in that collection, as well as sources of resistance to witches room. We have not been able yet to exploit this asset that we have right now in Thailand. The good news, sadly, is that uh, we can now screen the core collection inside Thailand because we already have the diseases. So this is, uh, again, the same slide that I showed you before. Uh, you can see here, these are pictures taken few, well, a couple of days ago. You have Rayon 70, Rayon, uh, I think it is Rayon 72 and KU50 here. So I see the difference between these two clones with uh, another one that is very susceptible to the disease. So there is some genetic variability that is the first thing that we can take advantage of because it is already available. The other interesting thing is that Waxi one clone shows what is called the recovery capacity. You see the lower leaves infected with the virus, but the plant sort of outgrows the virus, and the top leaves don't have a symptom. Uh, this is, in a, in a way, a, a degree of, of tolerance uh, that uh, we can take advantage of. Of course, at the end, what matters is not what is in the leaves, but what is underground. So what is the productivity of these materials once they have been hit by the virus is something that we have to see. But we are keeping our eyes open. We have a fantastic team of scientists in Thailand with keen eyes that can really detect uh, what is going on. And we have the support of people like James with all the experiences, uh, experience that we need to see and to know what we need to look for. So, uh, what we have now is a possibility of deploying these varieties that are sort of uh, better than the rest, which in combination with a management of clean planting material, treatings and cuttings with insecticides and rotting the plants, might be effective slowing down the disease. This is what we have, and we have to use it. But that is unlikely to be the ultimate solution. And we have to prepare for the worst. So we have to deploy germplasm carrying resistance. Uh, the original sources were 
all varieties from segregating material from Africa, which was introduced in 2011. These materials have been crossed already with Thai elite germplasm. And we have segregating populations here. And these clones have been proven to be carrying CMD2. So we are multiplying them. We are also multiplying the five elite clones from IIPA. These materials are excellent for resistance to CMP and have a much better genetic background than the original sources. And these materials are being multiplied. And then we hope to have three commercial varieties from India, hopefully introduced into Thailand in 2020. These materials are sort of perhaps, perhaps better than IITA in the sense that they have been developed for the starch sector in India. But you never know with cassava how they will re react in local conditions. These are certainly our hopes for the time being. And uh, we have the capacity to multiply them very quickly. So, the development of CMD uh, resistant materials, uh, sorry, I had, I, this, this slide should have a, a, a picture illustrating the, the excellent work done combining tissue culture and greenhouse for the rapid multiplication. This is a key ingredient. This, not only having something that is good for CMD, but also being able to quickly deploy. And this is what we have now, and also James made an allusion to it. So, one important experience we had is the integration of waxy starch. And uh, when we did that, is uh, showed some of the problems that the uh, that introvert in a single gene in, a, in cassava has. Uh, so basically, we lost about 40 years of breeding uh, introvert in a single trait. The good news is that we know that this is difficult, and we know how better to do it in the future now that we have to do it again, introducing uh, a resistance gene. So a key element is the limited number of meiotic events uh, leading to uh, undesirable linkages carried in the, in the segregating populations. If we do two cycles of recombination, these undesirable linkages will, will be more likely broken. So the, the waxy genotypes that we developed had some problems, but quickly the second generation of waxy starch clones started to, to fix some of the problems. So what we can anticipate now and we can tell is that res the introgression of resistance to CMD will benefit if we have two or three successful, successive cycles of uh, recombination. But whatever we do, we need to manipulate flowering in our crossing nurseries. One problem that we have in cassava is that uh, farmers in Thailand like very erect plant types. And a perfect example is Huaycong 90. Huaycong 90 never flowers, basically. It's a fantastic clone for the farmers, but it is a terrible clone for a breeder because the breeder needs sexual reproduction, which is represented by the flowering, and the flowering is marked by the capacity of branching. So a plant that doesn't branch is because never flowered, and this is useless for breeding purposes. So we need to convince Huaycon 90 to flower, but only in very special conditions so that the breeder can do the crosses, but the progenies will be erect plant like Wavon 90 itself. 
So we have made uh, very significant gains convincing cassava to flower. And we do the trick by uh, illuminating the plants at night with different sources of light. And this is what happens. The plant on the left in each photograph is growing under dark night conditions. And the plants on the right were grown very few meters away from the other plants, but under red light. And you see how convincing red lights are for cassava to flower. This plant flowered two times, this one three times, this at least once, probably twice, once, twice, twice. So this is important because here, one key issue is how quickly we can respond to these problems. So the other thing we are doing is pruning young branches. By pruning young, young branches, we can take seed from the first flowering event that is usually sterile. This is a tricky protocol, but you are already doing this in Thailand. This is the size of the branches that uh, have been pruned. This is a tricky process, but it is, as I said, already a reality here in Thailand. And see the kind of inflorescence that we have uh, out of pruning. We can have up to 120 seeds in an inflorescence that otherwise would have been sterile. So this is a technology that is being implemented here in Thailand. So, uh, and this is the final part of my presentation. Uh, the developing CMD resistant germplasm in Thailand is a rather straightforward process. We have been doing this for decades. Chalaisak and his team, now Berlin for Villa, they have been doing breeding for many, many years. We know how to do cassava breeding. What we don't know is how to develop in a matter of a couple of years, three years, a disease resistant. So the, the idea is to cross elite uh, Thai germplasm with sources of CMD to uh, more than one recombination to break uh, genetic linkages. You can have many different approaches here, and eventually you select for good agronomic performance in the segregating progenies, and of course you select for the resistance gene. This is very straightforward. Uh, but we can uh, implement some innovations here so that we can accelerate the process. So ordinarily what you can do is make the crosses and then you will go into the seeding stage, single row trial, preliminary yield trials, advanced yield trials, and regional trials. Many years to deliver the variety. Uh, eventually, we use data from somewhere along the way to identify good materials, in this case, that have good agronomic performance and carry resistance to CMD to be used as progenitors to generate a second generation of segregating material. And one of the innovations is that we can move the selection of progenitors for generating a second generation of CMD resistant materials a little bit earlier. One alternative that we can present as a, an improvement of this normal standard approach is something that we have implemented already in, in Colombia, is that you plant the seedling nursery a little bit earlier, and you grow the plants only for six months. That is why this square is narrower. You plant uh, sort of around this time, in, in the case of Thailand, and you grow these plants for six months. In, Mar in April, May next year, the six-month-old plants 
that has already been selected using markers for CMD2 are cloned, and because they are relatively young plants, you can only get three cuttings per genotype. So this is what we call the F1C1 stage. The good thing is that after a year, rather, rather than having one plant, as in this scheme, you have three plants per genotype. So these three plants can be used for conducting single row trials in three different locations. This is a, an important advantage because after that you go into preliminary yield trials and you can forget about advanced yield trials and you get quicker to the regional trial. Having this is very important for the breeder. This is the result of a nursery of about 150 waxy clones that we grew in Colombia. The same 150 clones were grown in three locations. And see the kind of relationship for dry matter content between two locations here, two locations here, and two locations here. There is not very good correlation, and this is for a, a characteristic that is high heritability. We expect to have much better heritability of dry matter content, and it is not. And this is because genotype by environment interaction is very large in cassava. By growing the same single row trial in three locations, we can do a much more effective uh, selection early on. One other alternative that we can consider is growing the F1 in three different locations. So we start making the selections across locations much earlier. Uh, we can select based on full seed or half seed families data at the seedling stage so that only materials from the best families are selected based on the data across the different locations. And then these materials can quickly go into crossing nurseries to generate a second generation of CMT resistant germplasm and quickly to rapid multiplication uh, schemes for the release of varieties that might be good for the farmers. So uh, this is a little bit complicated, but uh, the point I would like to transmit is that we know that what needs to be done, we know that we have different alternatives and over the next few weeks or months, some of these alternatives will be selected. In the case of waxy starch, we spend a lot of efforts developing the first generation and second generation of waxy starch. Now we have to convert these materials into CMD resistant waxy materials. It is promising that the uh, waxy one, which was not the best of the waxy materials that we released, might have some degree of tolerance to uh, this uh, recovering capacity after the plants have been is, uh, infected. But uh, for all the other germplasm available, we need to cross them with new sources of resistance and then go into the standard approach uh, of developing segregating the two genotype progenies that are waxy and carry CMD resistance. Uh, and uh, quickly we can start the phenotypic selection pipeline. Uh, this is uh, basically the end of my presentation. The key issue is that we have the obligation to deliver a solution to this farm. This is the task in front of us. We have some good things in our favor. We have the valuable support from IIDA who can share how much they know about the enemy, the experience they have gained for 30, 40 years of dealing with it, understanding the dynamics of the disease, the relevance of seed systems, all these kind of things that we could see so eloquently in uh, James' presentation. And more importantly, 
sharing CMD resistant norms that we have already here. They are being multiplied this very moment. So we know what to do and we have access to what we need to carry this out. And the big question, the big question is how quickly we can help this woman. And uh, my final statement is that our answer should be we have to acknowledge the emergency, the urgency, the seriousness of the problem. We must prepare for the worst, do everything we can, but more importantly, do it now. Thank you very much for your attention. is good for that. 
because it had that kind of devotion to the time. And it might be good to wander around. Okay. We had to deliver solution within two or three years. Polygen resistance is a headache. Single dominant gene allow us to deploy the solution very quickly. After this portion deployment that we want to have now in the hands of farmers, there will be time to think of the future, think about CMD1, think about CMD3, perhaps new sources of unknown resistance, but for the time being, CMD2 is proven to be efficient, it is easy to introduce, and we don't want to get distracted. We don't want to, be, we have to maintain the focus and the need to be aware of the urgency of delivery now, okay? There might be a problem 10 years down the road, hopefully. Well, in a way, if it breaks down, well, it will be a bad thing, but it will mean that we did our job the delivering CMD. But the thing is, uh, I think your experiment in California, you noticed that some of the varieties that you uh, tested there, like uh, P50, it shows that kind of uh, you know, performance, like after the first generation, first generation become infected, but for the second generation, they seem to recover. My point is, if you can combine that, because it seems like it contains that kind of genes already in there, so if you just add up CMD2, you have combination. Certainly, we are going to cross the IIT. Well, we have already crossed KU50 to sources of CMD2. So, by default, it is being done. Okay. Dr. Sebalov, I have a question on your previous slide involving the slide. Yes, I have. And 
we will now certainly do a second generation of process so that we further break down and this area. So we cross the end one alternative is crossing these F1 populations. Alternatively, we can cross back to this material. And in this case, uh, you will have a higher frequency of uh, waxy genotypes, but lower frequency of CMD materials carrying CMD. And if generation may be crossed, you so for each generation we germinate the seed, uh, the seedling, what we do in Colombia, we will grow the seedling plants for six months, harvest them, check that they are waxy, and grow the F1C1 in preparation for the rapid deployment in single row trials the following year in three locations. This is, for, from our perspective, a key a strategy to accelerate the identification of good materials.